from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Acronis Global Cyber Summit 2019. Brought to you by Acronis. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE. We are in Miami, Florida for the Cronus Global Cyber Summit 2019. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. We're here for two days of coverage around cybersecurity and the impact uh, to the enterprises and society. We have a great guest here to kick off the event, Linda Babcock, professor of economics at Carnegie Mellon University, author of the book, Ask For It, and she has a new book she's working on, and we'll get into that. Thanks for joining me, thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here, thanks. So, Carnegie Mellon, great, great, uh, University, they stole a bunch of people when I was in school in the computer science department. Very well known for that as well. It's kind of a revolving like, you know, door. With economics, math, mailing, yeah. machine learning, all the good stuff yeah. there. Um, what's going on in Carnegie Mellon? What's, what's new in your world? Well, it's just actually just a great place to be because of the focus on interdisciplinary work. You know, problems in the world don't come as disciplines. They come with multiple perspectives needed. And so it's just a place where people can flourish, attack ideas from all kinds of angles. And so it's a really great uh, place you know, to be. One of the things I hear a lot about, and we cover a lot about the, um, the skills gap, uh, certainly there's uh, more job openings than there are yeah. jobs. And interesting, a lot of the jobs that are new haven't been skilled for before in, in the classic university setting. So a lot of these jobs like cybersecurity, cloud computing, um, blockchain, crypto economics, token economics, all kind of have a math economic theme to them. So you know, you got computer science, you got economics and policy, seem to be the, the, the key areas around some of these new skills and challenges we, we face as a society. What's your take on all this? Well, actually, there's a lot going on in this area at Carnegie Mellon. Actually, the economics group at Carnegie Mellon has is, is been proposing a new major that really focuses on this interface between economics, machine learning, and, and technology. And I think it's going to train our students just for the next generation of problems that the world of tech is going to have. So it's um, very exciting. So let's talk about your book, Ask For It. Okay. Um, it's not a new book, but it's been around for a while, but you gave a talk here. What's, what's the talk and, talking track here at the event? Yeah, so I have a couple of themes of research, and it focuses on women's barriers to advancement in organizations. And so most of the work that I did with this book and my first book, Women Don't Ask, was looking about at how men and women approach negotiation differently. And kind of the bottom line is that women are a lot less likely to negotiate than men over all kinds of things, like pay, like opportunities for advancement, like the next promotion. And it really harms them in the workplace because men are always out there asking for it. And organizations reward that. And so the book is, was really about shedding light on this disparity and what organizations can do about it and what women can do about it themselves, how they can learn to negotiate more effectively. What did you learn when you were writing the book around some of the use cases and best practices that women were doing in the field? Was it more aggressive style? Was it more collaborative? Um, you're seeing a lot more um, solidarity amongst women themselves and men are getting involved. A lot of companies are kind of talking the game, yeah. some are walking the talk. What, what's, uh, what are the big findings that you've learned? Well, I'd say that the approaches that women use um, are a lot different than the approaches that men use. And it's because our world lets men do a lot of different things. It lets them engage in a cooperative way, it lets them be very competitive, but our world has a very narrow view about what's acceptable behavior for women. I often call it a tightrope, because women are kind of balancing that they need to go out and assert themselves, but they have to do it in a way that our society finds acceptable. And that that tightrope constrains women Women and doesn't allow them to be their authentic selves. Um, and so it makes it difficult for women to navigate that. What's your take on the, um, the um, balancing of being aggressive and the pressure companies have to, you know, keep the women population, certainly pipelining in tech, we see it all the time, mm -hmm. and, the, and the whole Me Too thing and the pressure that goes on, because norms are forming, right? So yeah. is there any new data that you, you can share around how the, the, the norms in the, are forming and what men can do, particularly, I get this question a lot and yeah. I always ask myself, yeah. you know, what am I doing? Can I do something different? Because I want to be inclusive and I want to do the right thing, but sometimes I don't know what to do. Yeah, of course. And it's really important that men get involved in this conversation as allies. And like you said, sometimes men don't know what to do because they feel like maybe 
they don't have standing to be in the conversation when it's about women. And we all need men as allies um, if women are going to try to reach equality um, at, at, at some point. But the new data really suggests um, negotiation may be playing a role, the work that Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In, but the newest work that we have shows that actually the day-to-day -day things that happen at work that's holding women back. So let me tell you about that. Yeah. So what we find is, if you think about your calendar and what you do all day, there are tasks that you can classify as being promotable. That is, they're really your core job responsibility. They're noticed, rewarded. But there's lots of other things that happen in your organization that are often below the surface, that are important to do, valued, but actually not rewarded. And what our research finds is that men spend much more time than women at the tasks that are these promotable tasks that are rewarded. Women spend much more time than men on these tasks that we call non-promotable that are not rewarded. And it's really holding women back. And the, how men can help is that the reason that women are doing these tasks is because everyone is asking them to do these tasks. And so what men can do is start asking men <laughs> to do some of these things that are important but yet not rewarded because the portfolios now are really out of balance and women are really shouldering the burden of these tasks disproportionately. So get on the, the wave of the promotional of the promotional oriented things. Yeah bet more and the men can come and pick up the slack on some of the things yeah. that were, quote, delegated to the women That's because right. they could order the kitchen food or whatever or, meals. Or help others with their work. You know, someone has to hire the summer interns, someone has to organize events, yeah. someone has to resolve underlying conflicts. Those are all really important things. Women get tasked with them and that really doesn't allow them to focus on their core job responsibilities. And so men yeah. can, step up to the plate, yeah. stop doing, start doing their fair share of that work, and really then allow women to reach their full potential. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this lately around how collaboration software and how collaborative teams, yeah. you're starting to see the big successful companies like Amazon, they yeah. have this two pizza team concept. Smaller teams, team oriented, if you're doing it, yeah. if you're on a team, yeah. these things go, you know, you give and you get, so I think it's yeah. probably a better environment. Is that happening or no? Well, it, it, it's unclear how teams kind of shake out for women in this setting because there's actually some research that shows when a team produces an output and the supervisor trying to figure out like who really made the output, who was the valued player on the team, they often overvalue the contributions of men and undervalue the contributions of women. So actually, team projects can be problematic if women don't get their fair share of credit. So the bias is everywhere. The bias is everywhere and, and you know, it's not that people are trying to discriminate against women, it's just that it's a subconscious implicit bias and so affects our judgments in ways that we don't even realize. It's actually probably amplifies it, you know, the gamer gate and a lot of things on digital and digital communities we see a lot where people are hiding behind their avatars yeah uh, that's also a pretty bad environment so I want we've been doing a lot of thinking and, and reporting around communities and data and I wanted to get your thoughts because I never really probed at this but is there any economic incentives? I'm mean, actually you're an economics uh, professor. Um, you're seeing things like crypto economics and tokens and all kinds of new things. Is there a potential path towards creating an incentive system yeah. that's cutting edge? What's the is there any progressive thinking around any kind of incentive systems for organizations or individuals? Well, when you think about incentives, and me being an economist, I think about those a lot, and I merge that with my work on the barriers to women's advancement. I think incentives is one area that you can actually play a big role, and that is that Organizational leaders should be incentivized, incentivized to see that they have equal advancement for their male and female employees in their workforce. Because if they don't, yeah. it means they're losing out on this potential that women have, that they aren't able to fully be productive. Yeah. And so that's, I think, a place I think that incentives can really be important. I was talking to uh, a great leader and uh, he said, um, and I'm quoting him, and I feel the same way. He says, he said, our incentive is business. We mm -hmm. get a better outcome with yeah. when we include women. Yeah. And I said, okay, can you give data? He goes, yeah, we make software. Yeah. And half the people that use our software are women. Are women, so right. So why don't I have women? So, and I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That the biases should be in there for women 
for women. Exactly. Created by women for women. And women spend more money as consumers than men. Yeah, yeah. And so having women on teams allows them to see perspectives that men may not see. And so it can really yeah. add to new innovative thinking that hadn't been there before by including women. Well, I'm excited that there's, there's a little bit of movement in tech. We're starting to see, certainly in venture capital, you're starting to see a lot more women come in. Still yeah. more boardroom work to do. But I think there's a nice um, sign that there's more jobs that are computer related that aren't just coding. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. male dominated yeah. pretty much now and still, still yeah. is for a while. But there's a lot more um, skills. There's all kinds of range now mm -hmm. in computer science that's interesting. Um, how is that affecting some of the new uh, pipelining yeah. of, of women? Well, I think the good news is that there are is increasing levels of women's attainment in STEM fields. And so there are more and more female workers entering the labor market today. Uh, we just have to make sure that those workers are valued and feel included when they do join tech companies. Otherwise, they will leave. Because what happens, unfortunately, sometimes in tech is it doesn't feel inclusive for women, and the quit rate for women in tech is over over twice the rate for men. Um, and some of the reasons are is they're not feeling valued in their positions, they're not seeing their advancement. Yeah. And so with this new wave of female workers, we have to make sure that those workplaces are ready to accept them and include them. That's great. Well, Ask For It is a great book. I, I went through it, and it's a great handbook. I learned a lot. It really is a handbook around just you know, standing up and, and taking what you can. You got some new uh, book, you got a new book you're working on. Mm -hmm. What's that going to look like? What are some of the themes in the new book? Yeah, so the new book is on these promotable tasks, and the way I like to think about it is there's so much attention to work-life balance. You know, how do you manage both of those with your career, your family? How, how does that work? But our work actually focuses on work-work balance, and what we mean is paying attention to the things that you do at work, making sure that those things that you're doing are the things that are most valuable for your employer and are going to be most valuable for your career. So it's a really different focus on the day day to day ways that you spend your time at work and how that can propel women to the next level. That's awesome. Linda, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. What do you think of the event here, Cronus Global Cybersecurity Summit? Well, what I got to say, it's not my typical event, <laughs> but I'm having a good time learning more about uh, what's happening in the tech industry today. So. Cyber protection is certainly a cutting edge issue, and certainly on the East Coast in Washington, D.C., certainly with national defense and all kinds of things happening. Ransomware is a big topic that's kicked around here. Absolutely. The town's getting taken out, like, oh my God. Yeah. Want Bitcoin in return, you know, taking your so systems out? Not learning good. Learning all kinds of new stuff to add to my toolkit. Great to have you on. Thanks for your insight. Thanks okay. for sharing. Appreciate it. I'm John Furrier here at theCUBE. We are here at Miami Beach for the Cronus Cyber Protection Conference. Thank you for watching.